All right, Brian. Well, a lot of our, our listeners, the cult of Cornette, the people out there, they love the classic wrestling segments. They love the, the wrestling history, the insight that we give. And honestly, we have more fun talking about that than we do this modern stuff. So this week, I wanted to do something because normally we're talking about some classic wrestling that I may have actually been involved in because that's I'm experienced in that. I can speak firsthand. So I wanted to figure out something that I was interested in knowing more about, that maybe I've, I've read the books in the past or I've, you know, gone over the records. But specifically for this subject, I wanted to do something I was interested in. So I went back and did a little research. And I would like to ask you a question. You are, as the people know, a wrestling savant. I would say no, that. Oh no. Well, no, no, you're you're humble for once. I'm just your silly little friend. I don't know anything. You're just a small town wrestling savant. Nothing to you know write home to the big city about. But you may not be able to answer this question, or you might. But I would I would bet I would wager I'd go to DraftKings that ninety nine. 0.9% of the people out there are probably not going to be able to answer this question. I will pose it to you out loud. Who, Brian Last, is the biggest heel box office attraction in the history of professional wrestling in Nashville, Tennessee? In Nashville, Tennessee? I thought you were going with, you know, ever. I was going to say the Sheik, but I think enough people know that by now. Although he did wrestle in Nashville, I don't think he was the top draw there as a heel. Jackie Fargo was the top babyface star. Len Rossi was a big babyface star. And it's a singles wrestler as a heel? Sing singles wrestler, singles heel box office attraction in the history of Nashville. Lawler did not wrestle in Nashville that often after a certain point, but he also was babyface after that point. He he did wrestle quite a bit in the early 70s there when he was a heel with Sam Bass. Right. Just, you know, just to clarify. But I don't think he would be on this list is what I'm uh, what no. I'm presuming at the moment. And it's a singles wrestler, so that takes out the interns and Saul Weingroff and uh, the Von Brauners or anything else. Tojo Yamamoto? No. I give up. You and you didn't even mention that the Welch brothers were always baby faces, so it couldn't That's even the have thing. been them. It's all baby faces. Tojo eventually turns baby face. He was there as a heel for a while, and that gave him the ability to stay there forever. But I guess the problem is I'm trying to think of heels that stayed there a period of time because I almost think like that's a prerequisite. But yep, you know, people came in and out a lot. Eh? Sputnik, you know, everyone thinks nope. Sputnik. It's Memphis in '59. Yep. It's not really. The rest of the Ghoulis Welch territory. The it, name that I am going to give you was a, I would say, not only the the biggest heel box office attraction, but was comparable in their heyday to the money that Jackie Fargo drew uh, over a 10 year period from the early 60s to the early 70s and would probably place only behind Jerry Lawler as a baby face and maybe Herb Welch as a draw period. What years? 1940 to 19, wait a minute, hold on, to 1948 with a, a reprise, um, no, I'm sorry, 1949. It no, can't be, 48, 48, 48. It can't be Bill Longson. No. <laughs> Who is it? Pat Malone. Oh, the Green Shadow. The Green Shadow. And the reason I brought this up is I, be, I was thinking, I used to do a column every month for Fighting Spirit magazine back when it was publishing. I didn't run it out of business. I did everything I could. But I would do historical pieces, and I'd been thinking about doing one about Pat Malone, the Green Shadow. And then when I thought about this topic, I went to the wonderful book that Scott Teal has published over at crowbarpress.com. My, my friend Mark James covers the Memphis end at markjamesbooks.com, but Scott has done a wonderful job chronicling the, the more Nashville-centric and Goulas area promotions. 
And he did a history of wrestling in Nashville up to 1960. And you can go back and look. I mean, it was a very complicated time in the 30s and 40s when the Goulas Welch booking office in Nashville got formed. And during the 1930s, there were two different wrestling promotions in Nashville. One guy was promoting heavyweight wrestling, which was not as popular as the light heavyweights. And in those days, that was guys 180 pounds, 190 pounds, whatever, which Roy Welch and the Welch brothers and Pat Malone and a lot of these other guys fit into. They were legitimate shooters, raw bones, you know, lean, hard country boys. But they weren't the the big 300-pound guys of the the major circuits, and they concentrated on personal issues and feuds and heat. And that's why that, that Tennessee became, in, through the 80s, known for a territory that, like smaller guys with more action, notice I didn't say gymnastics, but action, and... Well, the main title was a Southern... Southern junior heavyweight title. Yeah, and eventually that became the Southern Heavyweight Championship. But actually, and that title wasn't even instituted until the early 50s. In the late 30s, when Roy Welch was first taking over Nashville by being a wrestler with enough pull to have a group of guys that he could book and strong-arm in his way through the thing, he was billed as the light heavyweight champion. And then they would do a world light heavyweight championship, and they would have world junior heavyweight title matches, and they were big deals. But nevertheless, Roy Welch and Pat Malone uh, had a friendship and a long-running relationship, and you can tell by how Pat Malone was used and which cities he was most successful in were the ones that Roy had the most control over for the long period of time. But, for example, he, the Green Shadow in Louisville lasted three or four months, and they unmasked him. But the Green Shadow in Nashville lasted eight years. And on and off now, not every single week. And in those days, if you got unmasked 100 miles away from here, there wasn't even television. A lot of people didn't have radios, for fuck's sake, right? You you know, unless you were buying out-of-town newspapers from Bowling Green, you didn't know what the fuck happened. But nevertheless, Roy Welch sets up his booking office in Nashville. He's the boss. He's the booker of the talent. And Nick Goulas becomes his front man because Roy was still active and didn't want people to know he was the promoter. And Chris Jordan, the, the promoter in Birmingham that Nick had been working for, had just died. Nick moves to Nashville and becomes Roy's partner, and eventually they take back over Birmingham. And Eddie Malone had worked in Nashville as early as 1937. But here's the thing. The re uh, when I knew Pat Malone, and we've talked about him as far as the wrestling news and the pictures when he was selling the magazines and guarding the locker room door, right? When I was a 15-year-old kid, and Scott Teal says the same thing in, in his book. He rode with Pat Malone in the car, didn't know the questions to ask him. I, it was the same way. When I first started being allowed access to the back of the Louisville Gardens to take pictures, I still wasn't going in the locker room. It was just a backstage area that wasn't public. And right through that door, before the locker rooms that were downstairs, would sit Pat Malone. And he guarded the locker room door. And from the start, I I found it kind of funny that this, this old man comes all the way from Nashville just to sit there and make sure nobody goes in the locker room, right? But also from Christine Jarrett to all the boys, Lawler on down, everybody always put him over. And they're always, hey, Lawler called him pie face because he got that from Jackie Fargo. Because at the time, Pat Malone, he was, I don't know how old he was, because his wife, Sammy, who was one of Christine Jarrett's drivers, she had told me one time that he was born in 1900, which would have made him in his late 70s at this point. When he was arrested one time back in the 40s, 
it made the paper and he gave his birth date as 1910. So maybe he's almost 70. But then on it online, when he died in 1988, his obituary, they gave the, uh, the ages 88. So I don't know how old this fucking guy was. But he sits there, he's got the rumpled old jacket on and that old kind of Groucho Marx mustache, but not painted on. And his face, his head was round. He had become a fleshy old gentleman. And he had a pie face and he always wore this beat up old hat that businessmen used to wear in the 50s, right? You'd see in the newsreels. And it was probably that old. And that was his thing. He guarded the locker room. And like I said, everybody put him over. A lot of the guys, hey, see, he was a shooter. Or Christine would actually say, you know, he was the biggest draw that we ever had in Nashville. And to me, I'm thinking I couldn't process. This was before wrestling magazines. This was before television. Nobody was giving me any specifics. And I couldn't picture how this lumpy old guy that would, would laugh with Lawler and Dundee and some of the boys. How the fuck was he the biggest box office attraction in the history of anything, right? And at the time, he had one old guy come, came over from Frankfurt, I think it was, somewhere around Frankfurt, that had been his friend and come to see him wrestle in the 40s at, at the, the Jefferson County Armory that became the Gardens. And this guy, his name was Ira Fortner. I'll never forget it. And they would just sit in the back and slap each other's knee and tell old bullshit stories. And I didn't know to listen because I didn't know what the fuck I was missing out on. This was, you know, incomprehensible to me, right? But anyway, that's the thing. So a couple Pat Malone stories, and I'm going to tell you about the Green Shadow. Because everybody talked about Pat, sometimes not right in front of him, depending on the subject. But his wife, Sammy, who had to be, I love this woman, but she looked like Peg Bundy. Did you ever even see a picture of Sammy Malone? Was no. there any of the wrestling news files? I, I have to go back and check. I'm not sure, but I know Peg Bundy, of course. Well, because it, 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 everybody knows Teeny Jarrett never drove a car, and she would always have somebody drive her to her towns. And when we first started going, it was Petey Welch, who was Roy Welch's wife. and. Then I say about the time that Roy passed away, which I believe was in early 1977, either shortly before or after that, um, she made the change and Pat's wife, Sammy, started. And it, had, it was Pat's second marriage, at least. And Sammy was a very voluptuous woman. And she had a great sense of humor. And she was diametrically opposite to the kind of more reserved and prim Christine Jarrett. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall in the car, but she, yeah, she looked like Peg Bundy and, and my mom loved her too. She was great, but she would tell stories about Pat because Pat would ride up like with the referee, Paul Morton, or if Dundee was booking, he always got there earlier. He was riding with the boys and Sammy was driving teeny. So we go out to dinner afterwards and she would tell the stories. And it's until I started looking at the research that Scott did in the newspaper articles and et cetera from Nashville, that, okay, there's wrestler's exaggeration. Pat Malone, as the green shadow, had so much heat, he carried a knife in his fucking boot. Not for potential double crosses in the ring, but for the fans that were hitting the fucking ring to kill him. And he it was a Barlow knife, because he'd always say, I pulled out old Barlow. This one guy hit the ring one time and stabbed him. And Pat chased the guy out of the fucking building and caught him in the parking lot. And when they pulled Pat off of him, he was on top of the guy with his knife out, trying to cut the guy's head off by sawing from left to right. And I'm like, and, and Sammy's laughing at it. Yeah, that's Pat. And so I remember, I don't know whether this guy is 80 yet or not. In 1978, he's either 68 or 78. But like I've said, five foot eight and lumpy. But they had cleared the building one night, and all the fans had gone out front. And of course, a lot of fans usually went around back and waited to see the guys come out, whatever. But I'm up at the merchandise table. They're counting the pictures. They're folding everything up. I'm going to go back and tear down my photography equipment. And as I get to almost to the back entrance of the backstage area I talked about, 
Brian, there was an accordion door, one of those metal doors that would on a track at the top, but not at the bottom. And you could close it like a curtain or open it, but it's made out of metal. Yeah. Those right. old time arena doors. And you could, you could close off another room that way. Well, that thing was closed. But as I start, I get about 20 feet away from it. I hear bam. And the bottom of that thing that's not on a track bows out. And here comes a fucking human body rolling under the fucking thing. And I'm like, what the fuck? And there Pat Malone throws that door back and he's got it one hand throwing the door open and the other hand reaching in his pocket. And he's like, get up, you son of a bitch. <laughs> what the fuck? Apparently some guy had beat on the back door. Pat may have thought it was one of the boys forgot his bag or whatever, opened it. And the guy pushed his way by, said he needed to see Jerry Lawler or whoever the fuck it was. And Pat threw that motherfucker into that door. He didn't stop till he rolled and hit the opposite wall. And as he's getting up, he's like, no, no. And Pat's digging in his pocket. I'm like, what do I do? I'm not going to help the other guy. But I, I don't know whether, you know, I should talk to Pat at this point. Or I have to say, yeah, Sammy, <laughs> Mr. Malone's having a fight. And there was still a cop in the building. They were out in the lobby, but there was one still in there. And they come running. Sammy got there first and kept him from pulling anything out of his pocket. And then the cop got there and corralled this guy and saved his life. And this guy's... So, apparently what they bonded over, Roy Welch and Pat Malone, whose real name was Eddie Edgar Davies. And that was another thing. He was in the hospital one time when he quit traveling and Christine got upset because she went to visit him and she actually accidentally said Pat Malone and oh I'm sorry Eddie Davies and the, she said the nurse looked at her like why has he got two different names well it's a professional name she was very protective of shit like that but his name was Eddie Davies he worked as Eddie Malone he worked as Pat O'Brien um he worked as Pat Malone Apparently, he and Roy bonded over Ginger the bear. They both trained bears. At various points, Roy Welch had a bear named Ginger, and later in uh, later years, Pat had two or three Gingers. And they would take, when, when the Green Shadows run was over somewhere or needed a break, he would go out with the bear and take the bear on tour. Or once Roy sent him down to Florida to be a booker, when Roy and Nick were opening up part of Florida. So he and Roy Welch were together from the late thirties until, well, pretty much the end of Roy's life when he got out of the wrestling business and Pat was still involved because of Jerry Jarrett. And the, he was like a, one of the Vince guys, right? You always got to take care of gorilla or this guy or that guy. Pat was the guy in in the Tennessee territory because of what he had meant and how instrumental he was to their business. So would you like to go over a couple of his, the green shadows exploits in Nashville, Tennessee? Yeah, let's do that. And for the record, I first found out a lot about his career as the green shadow from John Cosper's book on Louisville wrestling. And like you said, it's a much shorter period of time, but it gave me an idea of just how big a star he was in the South. Well, and, and that's the thing is, again, because Louisville had a separate promoter, and at various points, they'd get people from the Nashville booking office from St. Louis, so they didn't run with... they. Uh, the masked wrestler had already been established in Louisville with uh, Bill Longson and Hans Schnabel as the masked Superman 1 and 2, and Green Shadow didn't get a big run. But where Roy controlled everything, he knew how to get heat, and he knew how to get people over. But speaking of heat... um. Let me set it up for you. In the late 30s, Roy Welch was the light heavyweight champion, as I said. Eddie Malone was making a handful of appearances for the light heavyweight group. And then there was a period of time where the light heavyweight promoter was out of business and out of Nashville. Although in May 1938, they were broadcasting the matches on Tuesday nights at 9.30 p.m. on WSIX radio. So they had radio wrestling in the 30s in Nashville. And anyway, they finally got their shit together to take over Nashville in the summer of 1939. That's when Roy got the old-time promoter back. 
briefly, and then Nick took over from there. And at that point, by the way, Roy and Herb Welch had the first tag team match ever in the history of Nashville on July 18th, 1940. And then the Green Shadow debuts, October 1st, 1940. And the arena in Nashville in those days, there was no sports arena per se. It was the Nashville Hippodrome, which was a roller rink. And Brian, I get. Do the kids know that back in the 30s and 40s, the Depression days, and et cetera, that a thing that people did constantly every week was to go out and go roller skating? It was still pretty big into, well, it was still big-ish until the 80s. I had my birthday party at Hot Skates in 1987. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, not even kids, but I mean, adults, everybody, that was the thing. As you went roller skating, they even had roller skating marathons in the Depression. Point is, as crazy as it sounds, it was the, pretty much the most popular arena in Nashville, and they had country music acts, and they had wrestling, and they had all kinds of shit, was the Nashville Hippodrome roller skating rink. And they had a big open floor, the oval track, and they had bleachers that seated, we don't know how many. Even Scott's not able to tell for sure because of the the fact that it was expandable and combustible seating, right? Not only the, the hard bleachers you can see from photographs of the time, but you could get a ton of seats on the floor or you could also have standing room. And then there was the proclivity for the wrestling promoters to exaggerate their crowds, right? So they've announced record crowds at 2,500 people, 3,000 people, and 4,000 people. The best you can tell from pictures, from newspaper accounts, and from people shitting on Nick's attendance figures and saying it only holds so many, you could probably get about 3,000 people in the Hippodrome for wrestling if you jammed them and they were standing. And that's probably what happened most of the time because, again, Teeny sold tickets there. Jerry Jarrett sold programs there. They used to talk about, she would say, oh, you should have seen the way we used to cram them into the Hippodrome. And they'd tell stories about Nick Goulas was so, whereas Roy never went out in front of the people and never was on television. Nick was all over TV and he was out there at the front at the box office on those sellouts cussing the people to get them in. Go on now, go on in there. God damn it, boy, move, move. We got to get you in. He was the exact opposite, right? So they launched the Green Shadow in the Hippodrome in Nashville, Tennessee with their weekly Tuesday night shows. There's no television because there is no fucking television. It's 1940. And the way that the wrestling promoters and the, that the matches are publicized is they not only put ads in the paper, but they have stories in the paper. The wrestling promoter would always go to the local newspaper and try to get in in those days with somebody that wrote for the paper, the sports section. And when something was that popular in a town, usually they'd give it some coverage. And especially down south and through the Midwest, it, in 1940, all the newspapers weren't shitting on wrestling yet because they knew a lot of people went every week. And remember Nashville in 1940, the, the Grand Old Opry, the Ryman Auditorium was there, the radio program was on, but it, for most of the people in the country, that that hillbilly music they play on that radio station from Nashville, that's that's some different stuff. It was new. Nashville wasn't the country music capital of the world because country music wasn't big enough to have a capital yet. They had no professional sports, and it wasn't a major tourist attraction. So they were drawing just regular people from Nashville, Tennessee that lived there. And the first thing that they do is put him over every week. And back in those days, if a masked wrestler lost a match ever, he was supposed to take his mask off. And so they never let the Green Shadow lose. In December, he's beaten Roy Welch two out of three falls. And the newspaper says, standing room only, 2,500 people. And December 31st, he beats him again. And again, in those days, there were only three matches on the card. And a lot of these matches, all of them were two out of three falls. Some of them had 
90 minute or two hour time limits. And when you think about it, 2,500 people, the average ticket was probably 75 cents in those days. So if they drew $2,000, then that's it, times 19 for 2023 money. That's the equivalent of a $38,000 house. And they're splitting 30% of that money amongst the six guys and a referee. And the main event is getting the majority of the 30%. So if you could get out of that $2,000 house, if the main event got a $200 payoff, that's like 3,800 fucking dollars. And these guys were turning these people away from the Hippodrome. And on February 25th, that's when he was first arrested for beating up a fan. And that's where he gave his name of Edgar B. Davies. He had to, but still nobody had seen his face. And they didn't know that Ed Davies was Eddie Malone. And by April, he was still undefeated. They did a sellout of 3,000 against the Irish Angel and 2,500 against Carlos Rodriguez. And you would see that every few weeks, they'd leave him off a card or two. Or every couple of months, he'd be off a month or so and come back. And then, again, going into World War II, the shows are drawing according to newspaper reports and columns, not just, you know, the wrestler promoter hyperbole. They're doing two to 3,000 people a week. And he's in the main event everywhere. And you don't know the Tarzan Jordan he beat, Soldier Thomas, Flash Clifford. But they're fucking selling out this place and they're turning them away. And uh, then at one point on December 9th, when he was disqualified in the third fall in front of another 3,000 plus crowd, the fans tried to batter down the locker room door. And then on... February 3rd, 1942, he was arrested again for punching a fan. In uh, June, they he went to a draw for the World Junior Heavyweight title with Gus Johnson. You remember him, Brian. Gus Johnson? No. <laughs> That's the th Nick and Roy would make up titles to give people that it would come in and defend them against the local hot star. And nobody knew. But they went to a 90-minute draw with one fall apiece. And at this point, Roy Welch had assembled his base crew that they always drew money with in Nashville and Chattanooga and Birmingham. Roy Welch, Herb Welch, The Green Shadow, Rowdy Red Roberts, Wild Bill Caney, Tex Riley. And then there was a newspaper clipping that in August 1942, the state of wrestling in Tennessee... Chattanooga was drawn up to 6,000 a week because they had that old Memorial Auditorium. Knoxville was doing around 2,000 at the Lyric Theater. They ended up having to leave the Lyric Theater, as we've talked about in the past, because it wasn't big enough to hold the crowds. Memphis was doing, according to this, three to 4,000 a week at the Ellis Auditorium. And Nashville, as they mentioned, was turning people away from the Hippodrome. And again, in August, a fan slashed the green shadow across the face with a broken bottle when he was facing Johnson again for the junior heavyweight title. In October, and I'm not even mentioning all the standing room only and the sellouts and everything. In October, another Gus Johnson match, a bottle was thrown from the crowd that gashed the shadow's head open and a riot broke out that involved, according to the newspaper, several hundred fans. And they kept, they had more Gus Johnson goddamn matches, but he never beat the Green Shadow unless it was by disqualification. In February 1943, somebody threw a salt shaker into the ring and cut the Green Shadow's head open, and he used it to bloody both of the baby faces and was disqualified, started another riot. In, in 1943, he was in almost every main event. And again, think about this. If they're drawing 2,000 people a week, that's 100,000 people a year. And again, if the average ticket was 75 cents in those days, that's $75,000. What is 75,000 times 19, Brian? I don't know, Jim. What is it? Well, I don't have a calculator in front of me. You know how to work it on your computer? 
Uh, well, you got to give me a heads up. You can't just throw that How about, shit okay, 75,000 times 10 is 750,000. What are you asking times me? 750. Wait, wait a minute. God damn it. Now you got me thrown off. Yeah. If they were even selling 2,000 tickets a week, that's 100,000 a year. If the tickets were 75 cents, that's $75,000 times 19 to take up for the inflation of today. That would be a $1.5 million they're drawing in a goddamn roller rink with this guy with a green fucking sock on his head. That's the kind of heat this motherfucker had. 1425000 to be precise, but maybe you well, need there a calculator. You go. And then in March 1944, Roy Welch, it was announced in the papers, and we've talked about this before, he tried to open up Florida. This was before Cowboy Luttrell. And he took Pat as a matchmaker, and they stayed down there for three months while they would come back up and still wrestle most weeks in Nashville. And in a couple of years, uh, Roy tried to install Nick down there in Tampa as the promoter, and he stayed for a while, but they couldn't, the only promotion they couldn't really open up and get a foothold in was Florida. And it was till what, the the 60s when Lester Welch finally got a piece that they really had any longevity, the Welch family in Florida. But anyway, listen to this one. September 26, 1944. Otto Ludwig beat Roy Welch and then came out to second the Green Shadow against Chief Saunook. And they had a riot, and Ludwig was arrested for assault with intent to murder a policeman. Whoa. With a stick. Apparently, he took the cop's nightstick away. They had a standing room only crowd, and they were back the following week with a tag team match, Herb and Roy against Green Shadow and Otto, and they sold out again. And then, for whatever reason, in 19 March of 45, they announced that a random match with a nobody was Green Shadow's last match in Nashville. And everybody went thinking, well, They'll finally beat him, he'll unmask. He won and just left for a year. And that was apparently, again, the time that Roy was sending people down to Florida because when Nick started in 1946 running Tampa, the main event was the Green Shadow over the Crimson Terror. And then he, uh, a couple matches in 46, he did some stuff with Ginger the Bear Green Shadow returns again in Nashville in 48. Main event versus Tex Riley. Standing room only. He starts winning the main event every week again. And then found May 25th, he beat Herb Welch two out of three falls. And several fans got arrested for attacking him. And then finally, the following week, they did a screwy deal where... The Green Shadow was unmasked even though he won. He beat Herb Welch two out of three falls in front of a standing room only crowd to win the junior heavyweight title. But in the process of that, Herb Welch unmasked him and they revealed his name was Pat O'Brien. And then he worked a few more weeks in main events, did a few more sellouts and dropped the junior heavyweight title to Herb and left again. And then. He was back a spot here and there after that in Nashville. He even lost to Ginger the Bear that was his his bear because Pat O'Brien could do, do jobs and still main event and get heat, but the Green Shadow was never allowed to lose. And then finally, somehow they turned him babyface. By the end of 1949, he lost a hair match to the Black Phantom and it, this is where this finish comes from, Brian. I didn't know until I did this this research that it ever worked. You know how every time that a baby face is booked to lose their fucking hair, the promoter thinks that the fans will say, no, no, he got screwed, don't cut his hair. Yeah, I know a promoter actually who thought that. Yeah. Well, I learned it from fucking Tennessee, and I didn't learn what they learned. But guess what? They actually did it. He lost a hair match, but the fans threatened to riot if they cut his hair. Wow. And and they wow. wouldn't do it. Oh, wow. 
And then the following re the following week, they had a rematch. They did standing room only again, and he got his head shaved and left the territory. And he was the Southern heavyweight champion in Tampa in 1950 as the Green Hornet. He was either 40 or 50 years old at that point. And then, by the way, more Nashville. This was now the Green Shadow Run was over. But on May 15th, 1951, in a World Junior Heavyweight title match, Vern Gagne beat Pat O'Brien, two straight falls. And on December 4th, 1951, Pat O'Brien returned, lost by disqualification, and got arrested for getting in a fight with a fan. He was Southern Tag Team Champion with Carl Kowalski. He was Southern Tag Team Champion with Rowdy Red Roberts. Yeah, May 18th, 1953, he's in his mid-40s or 50s, I don't know, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He beats Dick Lever, who was a longtime outlaw guy in the, in the territory, and in the process makes the paper because he hit a fan, a member of the VFW, and a 350-pound deputy sheriff from Murfreesboro, <laughs> and went to jail for that. The trifecta. On June 9th, 1953, Eddie Gossett beat Pat O'Brien by disqualification. So we, <laughs> the future Eddie Graham, who was a Tennessee boy, is on the way up when Pat was on the way down. And two weeks in a row in September, Freddie Blassie beat Pat O'Brien two out of three falls. And then his last appearance that I could see that uh, I think was on record in, as far as in the ring in Nashville, there was a Christmas time show to benefit needy families in 1958, and he came back and put Tex Riley over. And the main event was the Fargos against Corsica Joe and Corsica Jean. They drew 6,000 people at the, the big auditorium they had down, downtown now. But statistics, real quick, and if you got any questions. His first appearance in Nashville as the Green Shadow was October 1st, 1940. And he was unmasked by Herb Welch on June 1st, 1948. In that period of time, he had 157 matches in Nashville. 102 were main events and 44 were sellouts. And as Pat O'Brien in 1949, he had three more main events and three more sellouts. That is why that all those people used to tell me when I was a kid that that lumpy, pie-faced old man was the biggest heel that the fucking business had ever seen. And I had no way to have the appreciation of it. What do you got? Well, I don't have too much. You kind of answered a lot of my questions. A fascinating look. You know, I almost wish there was a book uh, years ago, Nick Toshis put out a book, The Unsung Heroes of Rock and Roll. There should be one of those about wrestling, not just like the last 20 years, but people who were interesting, who did interesting things that most fans would never hear of. And why would they? Yeah. Because there's no, first of all, there's no footage, at least that I know of. You're talking about... There's like three pictures in existence of the Green Shadow. A couple of pictures they used to use in the newspaper ads, and that's it. Yeah, so I mean, segments like I this. Got, I got an autographed picture of Pat Malone one time, but it was Eddie Malone, and it was from the 1930s, one of those cool old shots, and boy, he was a lean, mean bastard in those days, but he had no pictures of the Green Horn, of the Green Shadow. Hey, listen, if someone had walked up to him in, let's say, 1980 with a picture of the Green Shadow, would he have signed it? Would he have been willing to admit Oh, yeah, he, it, well, he probably would have stole it. <laughs> Sent it to Norm Keitzer, said it was his. Yeah, and, and who's going to stop him? You know, it's funny, his last big feud was with Jim Cornette. Hey, no, we never had a <laughs> But no, and you know, that's a, now that I, I am able to go back and so many of the historians have researched a lot of this stuff and they've got the, you know, the newspapers.com and all that stuff. Now we can get things we never could get before. I find myself more and more fascinated by these people that not only invented this stuff, but they had to promote and draw crowds and sell tickets with no television, with no, there were no interstates. You couldn't like, oh, we'll have a big show and people will come in from all over. It was an all day deal to go from Louisville to Nashville back then, 180 miles. 
you had to draw crowds from town with no television, with only newspaper and word of mouth and hanging posters on the walls. And that's why they had to get over in these buildings with their personalities and the heat in the finishes and draw those same people back every week and then get the the big overflows for the special, you know, blow-off matches, grudge matches, mass matches, whatever. But when you go and look at Amarillo, Texas, those guys that we talked about like Dutch Mantell and Cal Farley, the original Dutch Mantell, he's not that old. In 1930, when Amarillo's a cow town with mud fucking streets and they're drawing 7,000 people because everybody in town had to see those two guys fight. I love that shit. It's so fascinating to me. For a place like Nashville or a lot of small towns back then that ran wrestling, if you don't have TV, and let's assume most places didn't have radio coverage, you, that means you're basically going on your own programs that you sell at the arenas. Yeah. And whatever you can actually get into the newspaper and word of mouth, like you said, posters being hung up, was a masked heel like the perfect gimmick or the perfect heel for that kind of situation? You know, well, it's almost like a movie serial. What will happen next week with, you know, I mean, it, the name works, the green shadow, but just more in terms of, will he be unmasked? Will we find out who he is? There's no TV, there's no radio, but they're still intrigued. Yes, and that's the thing is that's why you had to go live to see because you weren't even going to see a picture probably. If, you know, if if you didn't, go to the arena, you were not going to see that mask come off, and this could be the week. And think about this. Now, obviously, wrestling has been built on, if something works, do it to death, right? Whether it be the, the copies of Buddy Rogers or the copies of the Road Warriors or whatever the case. Masked wrestlers were omnipresent in the Tennessee territories right through to the 80s that finally, they were mostly job guys, but Think about the big, the big main event talent that the interns, the infernos, all the mass. But at the same time, Nick could pull out the mass superstars. Who are they? We don't even fucking know. If you put a mask on somebody in Tennessee after that for forty years, it gave them a little something more than what they had to begin with, because of the green shadow. Dream Machine, early eighties. Dream Machine. But I mean, you know, the 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 parade of masked heel tag teams through the 50s and 60s and early 70s, and the, you know, uh, Jerry Jarrett was fascinated with Mr. Wrestling and kind of created Mr. Wrestling too, and and then he had Dick Steinborn play him when he couldn't get the real yes. one. Yes, and you know that's the thing is that the Green Shadow, uh, there may have been a few other masked guys, you know, before that, but in Nashville, but. He was so successful and is so dominant, drew so much money that not only did he have a job in that territory for life, but he influenced as many heels to come along in that territory as Buddy Rogers may have inf influenced nationally to come along and do the same thing. That was where you were going to see masked wrestlers way past the point where it wore off everywhere else because of that legacy. Well, it was quite the legacy, and that was Pat Malone, and as you said, let's end with what you started with, the best drawing heel in Nashville wrestling history. Pat Malone, old pie face, and the meanest man in the world, too. <laughs> Who else do you know that actually would try to saw somebody's head off instead of just stab them and get it over with? But Brian, you know what the, the heart-wrenching part of this thing is? The old-time wrestling, the historical wrestling versus what we got today. No, I do, what the most heart wrenching part is the it, most heart wrenching thing back in those days, those guys had to shave their balls. What they had to, they all oh, these guys had balls the size of cantaloupes and they needed shaves. But nowadays, this current crop of wrestlers, well, they can hardly find them if they've got them. And I don't think they have any hairs on them like normal people, like you and me and the rest of our audience. It's kind of scarce down there. But for 99% of the male population of the species of the human race on this planet, you need to get down there and do some maintenance every, every once in a while. And back in the Roy Welch and the Green Shadow and all those guys, Rowdy Red Roberts, I bet you they had literal 
pontoons of bushes coming out from between their legs because of the oh. amount and size of their balls, but they didn't have the technology back then to be able to do something about it like we've got today. I mean, they were using well, straight razors. Well, I don't want to think about how the uh, the legends of wrestling shave their testicles, but we could talk about what people today can possibly do to not be them. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, because now with Manscaped, our friends over at Manscaped that we've been praising and talking about and holding up to public praise for, for years now, they've now they've got a revolutionary new item. You know that the lawnmower has been the greatest personal grooming tool on the planet in the history of the human in the history of balls, but now the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is out. Not only a new number, but a nickname. It's three times as good as it was before. Well, listen to this. Why, why, why three times? It's the five. It's the lawnmower five. Well, it's three times as good as the 4.0. It's because three times it's got, as good as the 4.0. Okay, gotcha. That's right, because it's got a new name, a new nickname, a new number. I'm telling you, this thing has been upgraded. Listen, the two... They feature two next-generation interchangeable, two. two of them, interchangeable skin-safe blade heads. There's a standard trimmer blade and a new foil blade for a smooth finish. You can shellac your boys if you want to. And remember the old one? It had a LED spotlight so you could backlight everything and see what you were trimming. Dual LED spotlights. They provide contrast so you can shed light on even the darkest places. This is going to be like, like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck on stage with spotlights on them. Overture, curtain lights, this is it, the night of nights. You're going to shave your balls right now, and you're not going to cut yourself and bleed to death. Overture. I'm okay, okay, you. okay. And of course, for those who like a challenge, there's the new disco mode. Where the lights go on and off, and you have to just yes. hope for the best. And your balls suddenly are covered with mirrors, and they're reflecting everywhere. <laughs> but besides that, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra comes with a travel case and even a travel lock feature, so it doesn't turn on in your bag in the airport and people think you're carrying the Didolator Mach 3 around. Once again, folks, Manscaped has saved your balls. And right now, if you go to manscaped.com, you're going to get 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE. 20% off and free shipping this incredible, revolutionary new device. All you got to do is go to manscaped.com and use the code DRIVE, and your balls are safe and space age. All right, I don't know about space age. Hold on, let me see. Like this? Space age? Oh, for heaven's sake, I knew you were going to do something like that. NBC. I swear to God, that's what it was. Boom, boom, boom. That's what it was. That's what I just played. I am a talented musician. I can play can all sorts of three-note jingles <laughs> that you can imagine. Can I see your colorful peacock? You can't, but let me just say before we wrap this up, on the topic of... What are we wrapping up? Manscaped. The new Manscaped 5.0 just arrived here uh, two days ago. Very excited to uh, see the packaging. Well, goddammit, my, my mail is behind because mine hasn't showed up yet, but I can't wait to get down in the crack of my ass and start fucking weed whacking. You see, no one needed to hear that. That wasn't what I was hoping you would say, but one more time, what's that promo code, Jim? Manscaped.com promo code DRIVE, 20% off and free shipping. And again, you're going to be sliggered and come on a gold tooth right between your legs. And your uh, partner may really like that, I would assume, I would imagine, unless they are uh, Neanderthals. Well, it, in, unless it's like a department store that your partner's with somebody in, and then you should probably keep your balls to yourself. But anyway, what are you doing over on your, <laughs> your own network where you have your own balls this week? We are keeping our balls to ourselves, but letting you enjoy checking out what we do. If that makes any sense or none, find out on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast <laughs> Network on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, of course. The Wrestling News. Each and every day, get your free wrestling newscast direct to you every morning 
No conjecture, no opinion, no paywall, no clickbait, just the wrestling news. Get it today directly from thewrestlingnews.com or subscribe to Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention, this week's edition of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, his guest, Gary Michael Capetta, the famed ring announcer. Oh, my friend Gary. Always a great guest, always has great stories. Hear that today, suawpod.com to get it directly, or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The world's most dangerous announcer. You gave him that name, right? I gave him that name because David Letterman gave Paul Schaefer that name, and he reminded me of our Paul Schaefer. And of course, David Letterman gave Paul Schaefer that name because he grew up in Indianapolis watching the world's most dangerous wrestler, Dick the Bruiser. And his mom gave him that name. But once again, suawpod.com. Dick the Bruiser, no one... Actually, his mother didn't give him any of those names. Actually, that's true. I was going to say the biggest mystery about Dick the Bruiser is where did he get the name Dick? No one knows, and people think his real name is Richard Affliss. It's not. It's William, correct? Correct. Richard Vychik did that great book years ago on uh, Crowbar Press. Everyone should check it out, The History of Dick the Bruiser. That's not the exact name of the book, but the biography of Dick the Bruiser, the world's most dangerous man, dangerous wrestler. You got well, me and, and by the way, he was, he was a dick. Well, now, he was called Dick, referred to as Dick, before he got in wrestling with Dick Affliss. Have you seen, I've seen football pictures. I know I have. So well, he, maybe they were just describing him, because that is somewhat of a consensus that he could also be a bit prickly. And you go back and check some footage of him in the 50s, so impressive, like a Brock Lesnar in the ring, and by the late 70s, like a Chris Jericho looking <laughs> self in the ring. But once again, the 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! <laughs> go through the archive today at 605pod.com. The Mothership will be landing at some point soon. But go through the archive. The, the mother slip. The mother slip. I'm going to send you that in the mail. The mother slip will be. <laughs> the mother ship will be landing soon, uh, or maybe not. But don't try to ship the slip to me. If you ship the shit and slip to me, I'm going to ship the shit and slip right back to you. Thank you to everyone who has been listening to the old shows recently. Big surge oh. in recent listeners. But 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Uh, I hate it when you're feeling that healthy. That was for you. That was for yeah, you. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to say thank you. What? Thank you to all the people who have been sending the schlip. Anyway, 